Welcome everyone. I'm Laura DeFranco, the CEO of Brave Healer Productions. And here to here with me today to help wake the world up to what's possible for healing are some of the authors of a new book that we have coming out. This one is called The Caregiver's Advocate, a complete guide to support and resources. Our lead author, Debbie DeMoss Compton, I, I just have to give her a shout out before we start. Debbie had a huge mission and vision for gathering this stellar group of expert authors for this topic. It is so needed in the world right now for so many reasons. I'm very, very passionate about the book and about you, Debbie. Thank you so much for what you do in the world and for gathering all of us together to talk about this and really help people who, and, and I don't know anyone who isn't giving care to someone. Um, and even if you want to talk about giving it to yourself, where we all are going to benefit from this book in so many different ways. So let's chat with our authors today. Nikki Sargent is an Alzheimer's live-in carer with an integrative approach to caring, encouraging a lifestyle of healthy diet, sleep and exercise, along with music and stimulation. Rena Yudkowski is the CEO of Memory Matters, where she teaches online memory improvement courses to midlifers and seniors. And we've got Dr. Carol Sargent with us. She's passionate about enabling and empowering dementia community and people with other hidden disabilities, their families and friends to find the freedom and joy of meeting new people, finding new experiences and spending quality time with one another through travel. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to talk to you ladies. Okay, Carol, we're going to start the party with you. Tell us about your amazing chapter. Well, first of all, so excited to be involved in, in this and also a big thank you to Debbie, who I've yet to meet in person, but have met her lots and lots online. So I uh, have written chapter 20, which is entitled Fill Your Life with New Experiences. And it's how to go on vacation with your loved one. And for me, um, the reason I'm involved in this is because my mom and my mother-in-law both had dementia and that completely and utterly changed my personal and my professional life on its head. Um, I was that geek in the white coat as a scientist who was lucky enough to work, uh, have an idea and a project that went into big clinical trials, but when dementia entered my family's life, um, you know, there are no medications that can treat dementia because it's an umbrella term for lots of diseases. And, you know, I learned from supporting my family members that it's about the different services and the environment that will make the most difference in the short and the medium term. So I ended up um, changing my profession because I wanted to put what I'd learned into practice. And for me, it's giving people the opportunity to still have new experiences. What we learned as a family was that the things that my mom had enjoyed, um, she got to a point where actually she couldn't do them to a level that gave her enjoyment. And we had to try and find new things. And that's really difficult to do when you've known somebody all your life, you know, if you're their son and daughter. So it's about finding ways that you can see what people really enjoy, maybe what they don't like that much, and challenging your own assumptions about your loved ones. And for me, the best way to do that is through going on a holiday and traveling, because that's where we meet new people, we try new experiences, some of which we take home and we continue to cook something or, or you know, to, to take up, I don't know, bowling or something. Um, but it's also about spending that quality time with your loved ones. You know, holidays are a time where everything else in the world isn't as important. So if life is challenging, you've got enough headspace and time to really support and understand one another. So for me, getting on that holiday is absolutely critical. 
and you know care burnout is something that happens <laughs> um, and carers don't think about looking after themselves and don't think about creating ways that you can have quality time with one another and lots of support is separating people well the dementia community they've been married for 50 60 years they don't want to be separated they want to do things together so you know my passion is about letting people know if you're still living at home independently you can still go on a vacation there may be things you have to plan a bit more there may be things that you may not be able to do in the way you think, but you can go on that holiday. You can be spoiled. <laughs> you know, you can have those new experiences. And it's so important because what I've seen is, you know, the individuals with dementia get renewed self-confidence, self-belief, go back home knowing they can do things. And, you know, you can see people come as the cared and the cared for. One is nagged. The other one is not listened to. At the end of the time, you see people who, wow, you know, that's why we've been together all these time. You know, I love you no matter what happens. And that's powerful. And those are the things when the going gets tough that you can go back and think, oh, gosh, that's maybe the fourth time I've heard that story. But that's OK. <laughs> um, and equally, oh, I would just like to say what I want to do. <laughs> And I don't want to be rushed, but I'm willing to put up with that because I know it's all meant for the right reasons. And, you know, the pandemic taught us how important holidays were. And for carers and certainly dementia community, you know, often they feel like they are in the pandemic where they can't get out and have that holiday. And, you know, I want people to read my chapter and think I can go on that holiday and and to be able to say the quote that we got from from some people we took away that, you know, my too good to be holiday came true. <laughs> and that can be. But you have to be aware of the additional things you need to take into consideration that sometimes until you're out of your own home environment, you don't understand those. But other people who've done that can give you that expertise. So you don't have to learn from too many mistakes because we all learn from mistakes more than anything else. That's life. Um, but if you can get people with experience who have done some of the similar things and not make those common pitfalls, then you can go forward confidently and enjoy new experiences because to me, that's what living's about. Thank you, Carol. Um, Carol, thank you so much for saying yes to this project and for what you're doing in the world. Thanks for being here today. So um, I want to move to Nikki. Um, I'll just say quickly about Carol's chapter. <clears throat> there was a, a really palpable sense of relief when I read her chapter. I'm thinking about aging parents and thinking about the box getting smaller and smaller and not having a way to uh, help uh, my people out into the big bad world. And so after I read her chapter, I'm like, ah, we could still do this. And I just loved having that feeling of different kind of possibility. So that's my uh, personal thank you to you, Carol. Um, Nikki, tell us about your amazing chapter. Thank you. Again, I'm very honored and blessed to be here. And Debbie is absolutely amazing. So is everyone else. I'm chapter 17 and my, um, I'm as a, a living carer, my chapter is on Alzheimer's and rehabilitation and could an integrative approach be the answer? Um, I first started doing care work in 2016 and about six months into care work, my first client was a lady with Alzheimer's and she was just such an amazing lady, so beautiful, so kind. So she just had, you know, when you meet someone and they've just got that heart and you just want to move heaven and earth for that person. And if you could just heal her, you would. And and that was that lady. And I, I was so, first time I put up with Alzheimer's. And if you read my chapter, you'll get to understand a little bit of, you know, how I felt um, and how it, I just you know, read up as much as I could. And the more I read, the more I realized that there is another side that none of us really realize when it comes to dealing with dementia, because we all think, oh, well, med uh, dementia is, that's it, you know, that person is never going to be the same again. Um, we've lost her, 
Um, but that's not the case. And, you know, I started reading things about diet and how diet can change. Um, I read doctors who was using different things. And I just thought it was like this whole new world opened up to me. And I just realized, you know what? There is a lot of positive out there. It's just grabbing hold of it and, and you know, and running with it. You know, like as Carol says, I mean, holidays. And I think a lot of the time we've got, I always like to say that with what comes to to um, Alzheimer's, it's like the new leprosy. You know, people used to have leprosy in the past and it's all, you know, we mustn't touch them, we mustn't go near them and all that. And it's not. And I think a lot of the time from my experience working with people with dementia, people don't understand them. Don't, they, don't, they don't know how to communicate with them. And therefore, they just retreat because they need to protect themselves. And in protecting themselves, they need to... They, they go into the back of their mind. So what I would like to put across to people is, you know, people with dementia are very much alive and they can, they, they've taught me so much and they are such incredible people. They've got incredible senses of humor. They, they, they taught me how to live and, you know, that's it. You know, they're a joy. Um, and that's it in a nutshell. Uh. They taught me how to love. How beautiful is that? Um, you're making me think a little bit about uh, when we're afraid of something we don't understand, we tend to run in the other direction rather than um, getting more information so that we don't have to have that fear. It's just your, your parallel with leprosy was like, whoa, yeah, okay. Why, why are we afraid of this? You know, And I think also the word integration they pick that up Laura they feel that and mm, that of just, course that just makes them realize that they are not worth being in your presence and that's what we do to people with dementia yes it's sad isn't it um the energy isn't right um and then the the word integration is so important so I wanted to just rewind and pause there for half a second because there are a lot of things that when we integrate our care, you'll see magic happen. You'll see moments of healing. You didn't expect to see all of the sudden, all of the pieces are coming together in an integrative approach, right? I get excited about that. Is there anything else you want to say about that, Nikki? Music. Music is my best tool, my best tool. You know, the first lady I looked after, she was a ballerina and you know, it got to the stage where I first met her. She hardly said any words and slowly, slowly, slowly. She, she was just, just an incredible person. And it opens, it's so the best gift or the best thing that anyone can witness is when you meet a person with dementia and you can see that they closed and then music just brings the light back to their eyes. They have a soul again. And music is so underused and so it's so important. It's it's magic mm. in a box. I love that. I have a um, great Aunt Barbara. Uh, rest in peace, Aunt Barbara was a violist for the National Symphony Orchestra and she lived till 94. <laughs> And I think that music is probably one of the reasons uh, for that longevity. Um, Nikki, thank you so much for saying yes to this and for being here today. Thank you for having me. All right, Rena, tell us about your amazing chapter. Thank you so much, Debbie and Laura, for making this happen. So it's a dream that I discussed with Debbie a long time ago, and it's amazing that it's happening. So I'm a memory coach. I'm a geriatric social worker and memory coach. I teach online memory improvement courses. So I actually wanted to help both the caregiver who's worried about their memory, right? Because when you work with dementia all day, you start to go, oh my gosh, is it contagious? Why can't I remember? So the caregiver, but also the, the person who has, we'll call it mild cognitive impairment, dementia, whatever you want to call it. There's a lot of techniques that we can improve our memory. So people always say to me, is it normal when I go to the fridge and I open the fridge and I can't remember what I came for? And that's the name of my ch chapter. It's chapter 11. What did I come to the fridge for? And it's four techniques to improve focus and memory. So I'm sure this has happened to all of us, we go to the fridge and we can't remember what we came for. We go into a room and we can't remember what we came for. Or where are my keys? Did I take my medicine? So these are the practical issues that are coming up every day. 
either for the caregiver themselves because they're stressed or not sleeping, or there could be a million reasons, or for the person that you know we're caring for. So the techniques in this chapter are just super practical. It's four different techniques that you can do without anything. It doesn't cost anything. It's free. You just use these techniques. Um, ways to use your own brain and your environment to help you remember better. But it's not only memory, it's focus. Because the bottom line is, when you go to the fridge and say, what I come for? It's You had a lot of other thoughts distracting you, and it's not even memory. But memory and focus are so closely related that we all blame our memory on what's really focus and attention. So there's a lot to talk about. And the chapter is actually based on a webinar that I do all over. And it's so helpful. It's like, it's been so helpful to people that I'm like, I got to write this in the book because this will help a lot of people. So it's about focus and memory. It's about um, also taking care of ourselves as caregivers enough to want to work on our own memories. So instead of just being worried that you're going to end up like the person you're caregiving for, um, instead of that worry, that fear, I want to empower people to have the confidence to use the techniques to improve your memory. And do something different. And some of you have mentioned lifestyle factors. That's also a very big piece of memory improvement. And the point is that we can improve our memory. We can change our brain and we can live longer and sharper than a lot of, you know, the people in our past, maybe our grandparents. So it's, it's exciting stuff. <laughs> I love this a lot. I was writing down, you know, memory and focus are so closely related. We blame everything on memory when it, you know, who knows how much of it really is just present moment focus, present moment awareness. I'm going to add those words onto what you said about focus, because what I know about when I'm in the moment is I'm mm -hmm. hyper-focused on that moment, which is the gift of the world, right? To be in the moment of the now. Um, what else do you want to tell us about that piece of it? I don't know. That excites me. Yeah. So mindfulness, what, the way that's coming to me exactly. is the mindfulness, which is a buzzword. Mm -hmm. And yeah, when we can be present, and if I'm talking to you and I'm making eye, eye contact with you, then my brain is only going to take in what you say to me. It's not going to take in the phone ringing. It's not going to take in Facebook notification. It's not going to take in, you know, everything else going on in my environment because I'm focused on you only and I'm mindful on what you're telling me and what you're saying is important. Um, it's all the different, all using all our senses to encode the memory properly, but it's being present. It's being present and mindful and, um, and, and yeah, and, but it's hard for us. It's hard for us. We live in a very distracted world. Um, all the distractions on our phones and all the technology. We live in a place, like in a time where everything is like so fast moving and there's so much ADD around that it's so hard for us to focus. Oh my gosh. Yes. I know it. <laughs> this, I hope that everybody just, you know, takes a breath on that one because that could be some of that magic I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm like just the simple moment of slowing down to focus in your present moment is, is, oh, it's so important these days more than ever. The speed mm -hmm. at which we are moving every day is so, um, so, <laughs> so fast. Somebody yesterday in uh, one of the interviews was talking about that topic of slowing down as, you know, very important for the people we're caregiving for, especially those with dementia. Um, and I tend to run at 150 miles an hour every day. So I'm talking to myself right now. <laughs> I'm going to remind myself. Mm -hmm. um, so just a quick thank you to all three of you. Thank you so much for pouring your hearts and souls into your stories. And then as Rena mentioned, the chapters are offering practical tools that are either going to help you or they're going to help you care for the person that you're caring for. And I love that piece so much. And the, I have a big gratitude to all of you for, you know, you, you teach this every day, you do it every day, but it's quite, that's one thing, but it's quite another thing to put it in black and white in a book, in a way that is a powerful, practical way, right. That people can get that result from, and you all did it so brilliantly. And this book is such a huge, huge gift. Nikki, I'm going to come to you for this next question. And I know there's going to be a hundred things, but what's the most important thing you want people to know about caregiving? I think the most important thing about caregiving, and it's a two side of the coin is, you know, it's that connection with people with dementia, you know, just 
taking time, even if it's just sitting quietly with them, just giving them that time, that space, so that they can feel not overwhelmed, but they can feel peace. I think that is the greatest gift you can actually give them. Because someone actually once said that, you know, sometimes with people with dementia, it's like they got bees in their head, you know? There's always noise. And I know that there's one lady I look after and she just always says there's noise in my head. And, you know, just being with her in a quiet thing for her to try and relax is, is I think, the most important thing because it's in that connection that the people can learn to trust you. There's no expectations there is, they, they accept it 100%, you know, they don't have to validate themselves because you're validating them. And then just picking up on something that was said just now as well um, about, and it, it just reminded me, you know, that I'm so good as a carer. Well, okay, I'm not playing my own trumpet, but uh, one of the things I try to do as, as a carer is give the person that I look after them the presence and the time and the space. But I realized while listening to this podcast that I don't give myself that time in my space. Mm -hmm. And I, I've just realized that that's really important. And when you're saying you're running at 160 miles an hour, that's me. You know, I've, I, I'm there, I'm present, I'm there. But at the end of the day, it's like, okay, now I have to catch up with everything. And that's something I'm going to take away from this podcast. So thank you so much. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for that. You were, you know, you were talking about the gift of uh, when you give the connection to the person, but when you give that connection, you're also giving it to yourself in that moment. And so it's a beautiful, you know, reciprocal moment. Um, Rena, what would you say to this? What's the one thing you want people to know? I want people to know that you can improve your memory. Uh, there are techniques it's fun. It's easy. You just have to do it. Um, and it'll make you a better caregiver, right? Because you'll be clearer and you'll feel more confident about your self-aging. It'll free you up. Like when you're not worrying and you feel confident about your own memory, it'll free you up to take better care of your loved one. So the message is you can do this. You can improve your memory and you can age the way in the way you want to. I love that. You know, it came up earlier. I wasn't going to go there because it's such a, a big topic on its own, but I guess what I want listeners to think about, and I'm going to ask you, Rena, you know, if you have had trauma, uh, anxiety, other things, and we, we may or may not be talking about somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia, maybe just anyone, <laughs> your ability to be present in the moment and focus and improve your memory is, is cloudy. It's messy a little bit. It's, you have to take into consideration where someone has been and what they've been through. And gosh, haven't we all been through something in the last few years, you know, with, with the pandemic alone, any, any two cents you want to say about that? Yeah. And um, there are a lot of lifestyle factors that will either contribute to worse memory or make you feel better on the other hand. So we, you know, there's a whole list of them, but I'll just mention met, you know, meditation, um, the things that help us with stress because stress impacts the brain negatively. So any of the things we do to help us de-stress and sleep, sleep is a huge one. Um, you know, for care, take caregivers who are woken up a couple of times a night and then they're expected to function the next day. Well, their memory might suffer. And for good reason. So it's a, it, it's a challenge. How to help caregivers get the right sleep is a different talk, yes. but I just want, we underestimate the power of sleep for our brain. <laughs> that was perfect. Um, and you hit on some foundational things, um, the stress levels and the sleep it's, it's basic. And we have to go back to the foundation when, when we're struggling like that, right. Tying it all the way to your memory and focus and the things that you're struggling with. Um, awesome, Rena. Thank you. Um, Carol, how about you? What's the most important thing you want people to know about caregiving? Oh, and let me get you to unmute, Carol. <laughs> Sorry. Classic. No Classic. Um, for me, it's the it's a learning journey. You're learning all the time. Caregivers don't wake up suddenly and recognize I'm a caregiver. It's something that they become over a period of time. And I think it's about 
don't be hard on yourself. You know, um, there's a lovely acronym that I use all the time now um, is we don't fail. Fail is an acronym for a first attempt in learning. So as a caregiver, you will make mistakes because nobody's trained you how to do it. Yeah, you, you, you are learning. And so it's about not being afraid to do, you know, a new experience or try an activity that perhaps, you know, before dementia, your loved one really didn't like <laughs> because it's learning about that individual because, you know, their life is changing. And the only way you learn together is to take some risks, you know, positive, calculated, but however you do it as an individual, but it's just think of it as you never fail. It's your first in term, first attempt in learning. And I think that's so, so important because just meet so many carers who think they're doing a dreadful job. And I look at what they're doing and I think, you're amazing. I don't think I could do that. <laughs> Um, so that to me is an important thing. I love that. All right. I wrote that one down. First attempt in learning. I don't think I've, I've uh, heard that one before. I've heard a lot of ones for fear, but not for fail. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, that is, is really, really awesome. Y'all are, I, I hope you understand the golden nuggets you all are leaving people with today. Just the little sparks of, of hearing something different for the first time hearing it talked about in a different way. Um, I don't know. It's exciting to me. Um, <laughs> I had this, this last question planned for all of you, but something is moving me in another direction. And I think I'm going to change it up a little bit. Rain, I'm going to start with you for this last one. So Carol, it's your fault. <laughs> Cause Carol said, <laughs> you know, so it, you can become a caregiver over time. And I'm going to add, it could be overnight and you didn't expect it and you did not sign up for it and you suck at it and, 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 and so, so Rena, here's how I want to, how I want to phrase this. Like it is in your lap. You don't want it. How does one decide that they either have to take on the obligation. There's a have to, a should there. You know how we do this to ourselves. Mm. Or maybe they decide this really isn't for me and I need to now get proper help. Do you guys understand where I'm going with this? This is tough, you know, Rena, what would you say to that? Okay, so what I say is there's always choices. So yes, it might've fallen in your lap, and no, you don't want to do it, but a, can you embrace it as a challenge? Like we embrace all the challenges in our life, sometimes kicking and screaming, but we embrace it and we say, we're going to do this. So that's one option. The other option is there are choices. So hired help can, might be a choice. Calling in siblings might be a choice. Um, doing it half the day and delegating it to a friend or neighbor half the day. There's look at your choices. Don't feel stuck. Like sometimes in the beginning, we feel stuck and it's like, I can't do this. But then it's like, no, I'm going to embrace this as a challenge. I'm going to open my mind. I'm going to be creative and resourceful. And there are choices. So just always, there are always choices. They might not be great choices. You might not have the money to hire caregivers, but there are choices. I love the way that you kicked that off. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Carol, what do you think? Um, for, for me, I think it's about having those difficult conversations with your loved ones before they happen mm. you know something I very much am doing with my family um so the as a caregiver the person that you could be giving care to in the future has the opportunity to say actually I don't want you to do that I would rather somebody else did that so you could still go and do these things because I feel those are important for you and I think it's so important that we have those difficult conversations. You know, my family, when my mom got dementia, we were very open about death and, and, and the, the big things, but we didn't discuss the little things enough. And it was the little things that were the difficult choices as a caregiver. 
have I got this right? Should it be me? Will I be good at it? And it's remembering it's a two-way process, caregiving. And I think the times when you know you aren't the best one to do it is when you look at the response and the engagement you're getting from the person. You know, my mom got to a point where being at home was too stressful. It wasn't my dad. It wasn't anything. But it became an anxious place for her. So moving somewhere different and get you know, and it was the environment more than the people around her, but moving. And then she was a different person. And so I think it's it's being brave enough, really a lot of the things that you were just saying just now, you know, that asking for help and recognizing there'll be things you aren't good at. Um and it's the response you get from the individual. And is it the response you want to see from them? And maybe if you're not getting that response, you, you need more support in whatever way. And it's asking for help because that's that's the hardest thing for all of us. You know, we can ask for support, but we never are really good at asking for help. It's a nice um, delineation there, the difference between the support and the help. Oh, I love that, Carol. Um, okay, Nikki. How, how, what do you want to add to this? This is so amazing gals, like this, this conversation, this, even this one topic, I know, I, I think it doesn't get talked about enough. And so we keep it all locked up and that builds that stress. So, so Nikki, what do you want to add? Well, you know, I think these ladies before me, Rena and Carol have pretty much summed it up. So I'm kind of left a bit of the scraps there to try and bring it together um but just looking at it just you know thinking outside the box as Rena said is is definitely it's just so important you know especially as caregivers because again as Carol said you know as a person moves from dementia first of all no person has dementia the same they do not travel the dementia journey the same way every single one just as each individual person is unique so is each individual journey of dementia unique and you know I know for some for some times like you know I've been looking after a, a, a lady and the family will come and visit and say well mom doesn't have that or mom doesn't eat that and it's realizing that you know as they get older you know they they, they change or maybe it's that filter in them that says oh no I'm getting fat I mustn't eat I mustn't have sugar but as they get older, it's like they don't care. That's what they want. And it's having that respect and allowing them the freedom and upholding their dignity and, and not trying to control people with dementia. Because I think a lot of the time, family, um, it's very new to them and you can't you can't solve a problem that you don't know. You know, we only we can only act on what we understand. And dementia is such a huge, broad topic with so many different avenues and deviations and detours that not even the professionals know it. So how do we prefer it? So it's just moving with that person, evolving with that person, trying new things with that person, what works? What doesn't work? What gets a good reaction? What doesn't get a good reaction? You know, and and just moving on that. And you know, it's at the at the end of the day, to me, the most important thing is the person must feel loved, they must feel connected, and must feel safe. If you've got those three things with a person living with dementia, you've got a person who is happy. And at the end of the day, I think that's the most important thing. I think a lot of times people put a lot of emphasis on what's not important. And the most important thing is, you know what, we all like as individuals, let's go back to how do we want to be treated? How do we want to be listened to? Because how we want to be listened to and treated is no different than they want to be. And a lot of the time they don't have a voice or we will talk about them in the room as a third person. I mean really no wonder they go into the back of their heads you know who wants to be that and so many times I've heard people on the beginning times the people that I look after in the beginning times of dementia they'll say I'm here I'm in the room you know don't talk about me so it's just that respect uphold their dignity you know 
we are the custodians of looking after them and making sure that they live the best quality life with dignity and pride at the end of the day. Oh my, I think you did a good job with those scraps, Nikki. All right. So, I mean, in general, this book is going to help people feel loved, connected, and safe. So I love the way that you wrap that up. Mm-hmm. Um, Nikki Sargent, Carol Sargent, and Rena Yudowski, Yudkowski, I needed to say it again. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you. Thank, thanks so much for what you do in the world. And thank you for being here today to share it with everyone. Thanks, ladies. Thank you, Laura, for just being so amazing and just teaching us how to do it so amazingly. (laughs) Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Um, All right, y'all. You might have heard something today that gave you the goosebumps. You might have a question. Um, You might need some support. This is way more than a book. This is a generous community of experts waiting for you to reach out and ask for that support and help. So please drop down into the show notes. I have everybody hooked up with their links. You can connect. You can ask the next question. You can explore their websites and see all of the amazing things that they're doing to help caregivers and uh, those that they're caring for. It's really, I'm, I'm, quite honored to be here with all of them doing this amazing work in the world. And of course you can join us for a book launch party that's coming up on July 8th, 10 AM Eastern. I've got information down below. We're going to gather with all of our expert authors of the caregivers advocate. We're going to have some fun. And if you happen to be listening to this interview anytime after that uh, July 8th date, well, that means you can hop over to Amazon and grab your copy of this beautiful book. Lastly, today, everyone, remember your words change the world when you're brave enough to share them. So it is time to be brave. See you next time, everyone.